Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Wall's End History Story. This week is another in the series of Tales from the Past in Wall's End and this is video number 18. I had planned to do a more in-depth video about one subject but I have not had enough time to do a lot of research this week so I've had to settle for some of the more shorter stories. As with all of the previous videos, the stories may be about people, buildings or just things that happened in the past. And some stories may be longer than others and they are all from various different years and not in any particular order. I hope you will enjoy it and find it interesting. The first story this week is actually quite a recent one as it covers some details about the Esso Northumbria which was launched in 1969. So not really as far back as some of the other stories that I usually cover but it had quite a lot of interesting little details in the article so I thought it was worth including. In May of 1969, Swan Hunters was busy preparing for the launch of the biggest ship at the time to be built on the Tyne, the Esso Northumbria, which was 252,000 tonnes. The article also noted that after the launch, those living in Leslie Street in Wall's End would finally get their view across to the river to heaven back again. Though it has to be said this would not be for long as the Esso Hibernia was not far behind the Northumbria. Just prior to the launch, some 1,600 workers were busy putting the finishing touches to the launch area and it was said that one man had been known to many as Mr Launch and that was Mr Norman Gilchrist who was the shipbuilding director at Swans, having been promoted to the position, position 15 months earlier. He had started his working life, like many before him, as an office boy in 1942, working his way up the ranks over the years to his present position. And it was said that he was unflappable, and he was quite sure that the launch would go well. The building and the launch of the Esso Northumbria had not been an easy task though. The building part had not been too difficult with two berths being merged into one, one berth which had previously been used for the building of the Mauritania and the other which had previously been used for the building of the battleship the Anson and this gave them a big enough space to build this much larger ship. After this, the more difficult issue was the many concerns about how to launch a ship that was 1,143 feet long when the river at the point where she would be launched was only 1,200 feet wide. The angle of the entry had to be calculated and they had actually taken an 80 feet chunk out of the river bank on the Hebben side, but the launch would still be quite tight. So to help slow down the ship, it was said that every jag drag chain on the Tyne, weirs and tees, had been used which amounted to some 1,750 tonnes. And every tug on the Tyne would be on duty, with two more standing by at Blythe if they thought they would be needed. After this, the main concern for the actual launch was said to be the wind. If it was blowing at force 4 downstream, then the launch would have to be postponed. This would then mean that Princess Anne, who was to launch the Esso Northumbria, would only be able to name her and break the bottle of champagne, but the ship itself would not move. It may then have been possible to launch her on one of the following two days, but if the weather was bad then, it could be a further month before she would enter the water. But, as most of us know here in War's End, the weather was kind and the Esso Northumbria was indeed launched on May 2nd, 1969, some 55 years ago. Mr Gilchrist had stated he was not too concerned about the issue with the weather and he was sure that all would go well anyway. And he had ended his interview by saying that they had been told to keep the ceremony of the launching of the ship light-hearted and informal and he said that this was at the request of the palace and he then added that we do realize that the princess is a bit of a modern miss 
He also mentioned that he had made sure that all the men who had worked on the building of the ship had been given a ticket to the launch and that the Swan Hunter Shipyard Band would be playing popular music and also Northumbrian tunes to reflect the name of the ship. Now, I was far too young to have been at the launch or to have remembered if if I had been taken down as I would have just been a baby or, well, really, I wasn't that young, but only a couple of years old. But I am sure that many of you listening to this will remember the launch and may have been at it as well. So I would love to hear any stories you have from the launch in the comments below. Another story that is also connected to the Leslie Street area comes from 1903. I think this one shows how different times were with cases of crimes committed by those who were under the age of 18. In this case, two boys known as Peter, who was 16 years old, and Thomas, who was only 13 years old. Please bear in mind that obviously their surnames were mentioned in the papers at the time. They were charged with breaking into a shop. And this shop was on Leslie Street in Wall's End and was owned by Mr. James MacDonald and his shop assistant had found that pies and cakes had been stolen from the shop when she had gone to work in the morning after the break-in, and these had been valued at three shillings. The shop, the assistant said, had been securely locked the night before, and Sergeant Tuff said he had examined the doors during the night, which was quite a common thing for policemen to do in those days, and he said he also found them to be secure. Although there are no details as to how the boys were caught, when they were arrested, they both admitted stealing but claimed that the shop door had been open and they had not broken in. However, they were both found guilty of shop breaking and stealing. Thomas was the luckier of the two, being fined 10 shillings for his part. However, Peter was to be sent to prison for 14 days. It seems like quite a harsh punishment for Peter. 14 days in prison would not have been nice for him and for such a small sum of only three shillings too. But no doubt this harshness was in the hope of discouraging others from doing the same. However, these days it would be unlikely that either of the boys would have been named and very unlikely that either of them would have been sent to prison for such a crime. The final little story this week is also from around the same area as the previous one and is about the building in 1895 of those well-known streets of Wall's End, Leslie Street, Jones Street, Gerald Street, etc. Now, it was said at the time that once the rows of terraced houses were built, described as upstairs and downstairs tenements, which we would probably be more likely to call Tyneside Flats these days, They would accommodate anything between 1,600 and 2,000 people. And this, the article said, would be a huge addition to the population of Wall's End, which, as at the time, you might guess this bit, was growing rapidly. The area where the flats were to be built was the site of the Roman Fort Segedunum, although then it was described more as a Roman camp. There was still a part of the wall that could be seen in an area which at the time was known as Camp Corner, and Mr Frank Buddle Atkinson had decided that this should be left for the people of Wall's End to see forever, so the land where the wall was would be fenced off and an inscription would also be placed there to explain what it was all about. Now, some of you might remember a stone in the garden at the bottom of Hunter Street, and some of you might also remember what it said, but if you can't, it read as follows. This stone marks the southeastern extremity of the Roman wall, which here turns southwards to the River Tyne. A Roman camp, believed to be that of Segedunum, here joined the wall and extended about four acres to the northwest of this point. The inhabitants of Wall's End are requested to cooperate for the protection of this interesting memorial of antiquity from which the town derives its name. This stone was erected by the owner of this property, Frank Buddle Atkinson, December 1894. 1895, I don't know why I said 94. 
The photo you've been looking at on screen is the original stone, which used to be in the garden, but it is now incorporated into part of the old Roman wall and stands in the grounds of Segedunum Museum, where I took a photo of it a few years ago, when I actually didn't really know its history. And this second photo shows you a more wider view of the location of this stone, which was also taken by me probably back in around 2013, when I visited the museum with my dad. Now I must admit it was great to later find out where the stone had originally come from, and why it had been placed there in the first place. Continuing on with the original article from 1895, it was also said that a new road, which was to run along the bottom of the terrace flats and between those and the railway line, which was of course the Riverside Line, would be named Camp Road, in another tribute to the Roman camp that had once stood on the site. And this was also why some small outlines could be seen on the ground in other areas as tiny as a tiny little clue as to what was under those roads and houses. So although they couldn't actually pre preserve the site as a camp or fort at the time, whichever you prefer to call it, and I must admit that I prefer saying fort as that's how I know it, they still did want the people of Wall's End to remember it. Of course, today it is a very different story, as the many times mentioned in my videos before, Segedunum Roman Fort and Museum now stands on the site where those terraced houses once stood, and what remains of Segedunum Fort can still be seen. And it is worth remembering that it is lucky that there is anything still left to see at all, as there had been many things built on the site over the years, as this was also where John Buddle's house once stood, and then the later flats, so a lot of digging and disturbing of the remains had gone on, with one rumour even suggesting that some of the ruins of the fort had been used as foundations for the flats. So, while Sigurdunum might not be as impressive remains-wise as other Roman remains along Hadrian's Wall, there is a very good reason for this, and it is still certainly a place worth visiting if you haven't been. And just to add here, I recently read an article where John Buddle's house was described as a Buddle Hall. However, I have always only ever known it as Wall's End House, but perhaps some people knew it by a different name when it was actually still standing. I do hope that you have enjoyed these short little stories, and actually as I've read them through, I have realised that they are all from the Leslie Street area, and that you have also found them interesting. As I often say, they really are just a glimpse into the past life of Wall's End. I do thank you all very much for watching, and I do hope to see you all again very soon.